All right, so this is part two of the lecture of the lymphatic system. We're beginning with the letter D, thymus, in your outline. And the thymus, what does it do, right? So it's a, a gland and it sits posterior to the sternum. So it's underneath your sternum, the sternum which protects the heart and the thymus. Um, you can see the position, it's superior to the heart. And it has two uh, larger lobes. So let's take a look at this. Right, we have a right and left lobe, and the thymus looks um, sort of bumpy. Each small section of it is called a lobule. Um, what the thymus does is it matures your T cells. So if you look at number two, um, there is something called the blood thymus barrier that is very similar to the blood brain barrier. So remember the blood-brain barrier, how it had to, um, the astrocytes created an extra layer on your blood capillaries so that materials from the bloodstream don't enter into the, the, the neurons, right, into your brain. Uh, same thing here. So we're gonna have a barrier of cells that protect the cells within the thymus from unwanted materials in the bloodstream. Why? Because this is where your T cells mature. Um, actually, the word T cell, T is for thymus. So a lot of you guys, um, now you know what the T cell, <laughs> the T and T cell refers to. Because um, if you remember, where do all of your immune cells, where are they created? They're created in the bone marrow, right? The red bone marrow. So when the T cells are created, these lymphocytes, they come into the bloodstream. They circulate in your bloodstream, and then the T cells will go into the thymus, okay? And then the T cells will spend some time here and mature. What mature means is that they learn to tell self from non-self. So that maturation process allows the cells that are going to respond to your own tissues, um, they're going to be destroyed, right? Because you don't want your own immune system to be alerted by or stimulated by your own body. You want them to ignore your own body and only get stimulated by non-self antigens. So your thymus is the place where this happens and actually you, only 5% of the cells that enter your thymus leave because 95% uh, of them are gonna be stimulated by your own body, which you don't want. So very few, uh, T cells make it out, and when they leave the thymus, then they go into a lymph node, and they re become residents of your lymph node. Okay, so lymph, lymph nodes contain lymphocytes. All right, so that's the job of the thymus. You have this maturation process. There's a hormone that helps this pro um, process. is called thymosin. Thymosin is going to be something that we'll talk about on the, the last chapter when we do endocrine system. Um, <clears throat> so. Number three mentions that the thymus is different from all other lymphatic tissue because it's a gland. It's the only gland that's part of your lymphatic system. And so the tissue is glandular, meaning it is um, epithelial cells. Because remember from unit one, um, epithelial cells make glands. The other organs, like your spleen and the lymph nodes, are reticular connective tissue based. So remember reticular connective tissue, how I said it was like a fish netting, and it's found in filtering organs. And we mentioned some filtering organs earlier in the semester, like the kidney and the liver, but lymph nodes and the spleen are also filtering organs. So actually, let's take a look at that detail uh, in the image. So notice that the background here Notice that the, the webbing, right, this kind of network of connective tissue, that's trying to illustrate the scaffolding of reticular connective tissue. So we have reticular connective tissue-based organs, and then we have a glandular thymus. Okay, so it's a little different than the rest. One really interesting thing about the thymus is that it shrinks as you age. So you can see in the notes at age 20, which most of you guys are probably around age 20, um, you still have 80% of your functional tissue left. So you have a lot of thymus that's still working. And then at 40, only 5% of that tissue is still functional. So it really shrinks and, and degenerates as you age. In fact, I went to, um, a gross anatomy lab at USC once and the, the professor said that, you know, the older 
cadavers that they get, you know, um, when they open them up, there's never a thymus. The thymus is just a tiny little wad of connective tissue. So you lose the thymus as you age. So one of the things about you use it or you lose, or um, you want to stimulate your immune system as much as possible when you're younger, um, because remember your T cells and your B cells create memory cells and memory cells can remain in your body for life, sometimes decades, sometimes a few years, it depends, a few years or decades or life. But you really want to use your T cells when you're creating the T cells. And so get, exp you know, you don't want to be too clean, um, but you also don't want to be too dirty because you can get sick. But there's this uh, sweet spot where you really want to introduce antigens into your body when you're younger. Um, you know, for example, vaccines, um, because you can create those memory cells and have those memory cells for life. Whereas vaccines, for example, don't work that well on older people because older people can't, they just don't make those T cells anymore. So um, it's going to be harder for the vaccines to be effective if your own body just doesn't make those memory cells. So that's something really interesting about your, your thymus. Okay, let's look at the spleen. All right, the spleen is uh, our organ back here. So it's going to be posterior to your stomach, <clears throat> and it's going to be located on the uh, left side of your body, the left um, abdominal quadrant here. And let's take a look at the spleen in terms of the cartoon is not much to look at. The spleen has an entrance and exit, so it does have a hilum. We have a splenic vein, splenic artery, and a lymphatic vessel coming into the spleen. And the spleen itself, so in, in your outline you have the spleen is the largest mass of lymphatic tissue in the body, so it's the largest lymphatic organ in the left superior abdomen, you know, posterior to the stomach. It's a thin capsuled, so it does have a capsule, this connective tissue, but it's thin, so it can rupture pretty easily. So if you hit somebody um, in the area of their spleen, it can rupture. Um, you may have to take it out, and I have a question here. Can you live without a spleen? And the answer is yes, you can. Um, there, it's not a critical organ, it's a, a little redundant. So your liver can also pick up the slack. So your spleen filters red blood cells and also filters um, your body's blood for pathogens. But you have, um, the liver can also break down red blood cells and you have your lymph nodes to um, help with the filtering. So it's a little bit redundant, but you are considered immunocompromised without the spleen. Um, so yes, you can live without it. You do have a little bit less um, robust immune response without the spleen. All right, so what does it do? It removes blood-borne pathogens. So that's something to um, know here. We talked about the lymph nodes screening lymph, but the spleen screens blood. So you can see our artery and uh, artery comes in, bringing our blood in, and you see the sleeve of white around that artery. That's called white pulp. The word is right here, white pulp. White pulp is a sleeve of white blood cells that surrounds that artery. So when it branches into capillaries, uh, the white cells there can detect anything that's coming out of that bloodstream. And then the red pulp, so you can see the bulk of the spleen is red pulp. Red pulp is this uh, site where your um, red blood cells are broken down. Okay, so if you look in the outline, the white pulp is a sleeve of lymphatic tissue for immune screening. Red pulp is um, has it surrounds the white pulp. It has venous sinuses. That's just a wider area um, of, the, of the veins. And you have macrophages there where they can take up those old red blood cells and, and destroy them. Okay? So the red pulp gives the spleen's ability to destroy the old red blood cells. And that's it for the spleen. I have a picture of the spleen here for you. Here's our spleen. Look at the size of the splenic artery. Really big. Remember, the splenic artery was a branch off of that celiac trunk. All right, and then this is a good, uh, so here's spleen, right? This place used to be full of red blood cells until I got here. So there's a little red blood cell. If I don't stop the anemia, who will? And then he says, where's the oxygen? And the red blood cell says, there aren't enough of us to supply it to the organs. Um, what's happening to the red, red blood cells? Where are they? 
and then the red blood cell says, it's you, you're killing us, don't you see? You're causing the anemia. They accuse me of hypersplenism. Have I created the monster, the very monster I was trying to stop? And then <laughs> these guys say, quick, run while he's inner monologuing. So the spleen here, right, hypersplenism is an enlarged spleen. And we just talked about how the spleen destroys red blood cells. So you have a large hyperactive spleen. You can destroy more red blood cells than normal. If you're destroying more red blood cells than normal, that causes anemia, right? Anemia being not able to carry oxygen around your body um, because you're low on red blood cells. So that's, that's the cartoon. All right, wrapping up here with um, some lymphatic nodules. So remember the word nodule means that we don't have that capsule on the outside. And there's two um, structures that are called lymphatic nodules, malt and tonsils. So I think that I actually have tonsils. Oh no, here's malt. Okay, malt um, stands for mucosa associated lymphoid tissue. So the word mucosa is the inner lining of our digestive tract. So our intestines, like the very first uh, innermost lining, the, the one that touches the food, that's called the mucosa. And so you have within the wall of your intestines, you have patches of lymph. So let's show you the picture here. So this is a cross section of your ileum, which is a part of your small intestine. And you can clearly see the areas that are very different from anything else, right? So those are your lymphatic nodules. This is an area where it's highly concentrated in B cells and T cells. And so you have this within the walls of your intestines. So if you think about when you eat food, you're bringing in any, a myriad of possible, you know, pathogens um, that are on the food when you eat it. So if your stomach acids don't kill it and it makes it into your intestines, then you have this another defense mechanism here. So if the pathogens cross the wall of your small intestine, you have immunity here. And then here's another example of malt, right? So it's very clear, a very condensed like a concentration of very dark nuclei, which is your B cells and T cells. All right, and then our number two, our tonsils. Our tonsils are in our throat, right? Our pharynx. And so let's find them. We have, um, the, this is uh, under the word crypt in your outline. So we have two palatine tonsils. So if you look at the word palatine tonsil here, we only see one, right? In, in, so remember that this is your hard palate and this is your soft palate. So when you open your mouth and you look deep at your tonsils, those are your palatine tonsils here and here. There's you know not much to look at and they just blend in with all the other tissue that's the mucosa that's in your, your throat. But those are your two palatine tonsils. You have one pharyngeal tonsil here located at the back of your nose, right? So this is also called an adenoid. You might have heard that before, your adenoids. But there's one of these guys here. So, uh, and then you have a tonsil that's located at the base of your tongue. That's called a lingual tonsil. Technically, there are two. And then the tubal tonsils. Remember when I pointed this out in the um, respiratory system, the little dent back here, I said that's the entranceway into your um, auditory tube, and there's a little tonsil right there called the tubal tonsil. It's not indicated in this picture, but it is. it does exist. So you have all these tonsils. So what are these tonsils doing here, right? So this is your, your throat, this pharynx, is uh, going to be exposed to um, things from the outside. So when you inhale through your nose, right, inhalational pathogens can get uh, caught here at the pharyngeal tonsil things that you eat and drink, your palatine tonsil, your lingual tonsil, and then anything that might try and work its way up into your ear, right, might get alerted or caught by your tubal tonsil. Um, let's look at, look at the word crypt or, you know, this crevice. So when you take a look at a histology slide of a tonsil, notice that you have the same circular structures, these germinal centers, the same kind of uh, image that you'd see in a lymph node, also present in a lymph nodule. And you, what you also have here that's not in a lymph node is this really nice big crack. So this is not an artificial thing. These are called crypts. 
C-R-Y-P-T. So a crypt is this long, elongated passageway into the tonsil. And uh, here's one too, right? So why do you have crypts? Crypts are to trap your pathogens because again, you can't just have, when you, when you drink and you swallow, the food just washes over these very quickly. But these are to trap um, your food and drink and um, possibly alert these white blood cells to the pathogen. Okay, so that's tonsils will have these crypts. So another uh, images of tonsil histology. So you can see that we have those nice round nodules with our germinal center that's pale, and then we have really long white cracks, a crypt. So here again, a crypt. Okay, some questions to wrap up. Uh, if you read this, typical lymphoid nodules often have a pale central zone called a blank, which contains activate, activated and dividing blank. So you can think about it. I'll tell you the answer though. The answer is uh, letter D. So the pale central zone is called a germinal center, and uh, those germinal centers will have activated dividing lymphocytes. Next one, the increased incidence of cancer in the elderly reflects the fact that lymphoid surveillance blank and blank cells are not eliminated as effectively. So your lymphoid surveillance declines as you age. And so when it declines, what's not eliminated as effectively, and it's gonna be tumor cells, okay? Because this, this is talking about cancer. So remember how I said how your thymus shrinks as you age. You don't make as many T cells anymore. And remember back to our blood lecture how T cells were the ones that could recognize self from non-self. They could destroy virally infected cells or cancer cells. So your ability to destroy cancer cells will go down when your T cell count goes down, right? So older people will be more susceptible to developing cancers because they just don't have the ability to destroy any precancerous cells that might exist in your body. General functions, if you look at the choices, it'll be all of the above. And large clusters of lymphatic nodules found in the throat are called, and you should choose tonsils because the word nodule is either malt or tonsils. Pyers patches being a form of malt, um, but those the malt is only in your intestines. All right, and we're done.